Okay, thank you everybody for uh, joining us for another edition of The Mix. Um, yeah, yeah go, go nuts. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to have Maggie Finch join us today. Uh, Maggie is uh, somebody I think very highly of, a, a good friend and an incredibly successful business person. Uh, as you all know, she uh, joined the Mixbo board this month and uh, I gave her all of 12 hours notice before having us join our, our July board meeting and, and with hmm. no preparation or background, uh, it was I think evident to everybody there that uh, she's gonna make a, a big impact on the company. So uh, thrilled to welcome Maggie. So Maggie, uh, why don't we start with how you started. Um, you dropped out of college yep. after a year. Yep. You moved Booze. to New York. Right. <laughs> and uh, with, you know, with that entire year of college experience driving you, you decided to start a company yes. in New York yes. called Eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the process of <laughs> going from dropout to entrepreneur in a matter of months. Right. I think going from dropout to entrepreneur is easier than going from, like, grad school to entrepreneur. It's like, you know, there's, like, it's like hell and chaos. You're, like, first year of college, and you're kind of uh, sleepless and drinking, and you have no clue what you're going to become, and all these things are just totally analogous to starting a business. So it's just felt like <laughs> one from that world to another, I never actually had a... Uh, a moment where I felt put together. Um, yeah, Jeff, you like that. I know that's my, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is, the decision in my life was that if I wouldn't have a degree worth really bragging about, it would be more fun to have nothing at all. So I'm kind of that all or nothing personality. Uh, but so to, 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 to say how did I do that, I'd say that um, it was good timing. So I went from a time and place where I had a, you know, a word, a brother word processor in my dorm room. And I was, uh, there was no mention from any teacher about using the internet really for anything to like literally, you know, 12 months later, uh, an atmosphere where people were scrambling to look for someone that would own this faddish internet thing, you know, within the walls of the companies um, that were established. And so it was just a great time to be young and be the person who would say, I, you know, I just order pizzas and send faxes, so I would be glad to own that internet thing that nobody in the top brass wanted to own. And so I think after doing that in a few internships at big agencies while I was in college and before, um, I was lucky enough to, to kind of be privy to the inner workings of agencies already. It just felt natural that, look, I'm, I'm, here I am in school, this internet thing is happening out here, I'm totally bored, shitless at school, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go s just do this internet thing. Um, and one thing led to another, and I was packing a U-Haul to New York City to meet a guy that I actually met in a chat room. <laughs> this is before Craigslist killers or any of that stuff. And uh, he was a partner at Kirsch and Bob and Bond, and together we started a little company in New York City called Eyeballs, which we thought was clever, I-B-A-L-L-S. Uh, and we had a very, uh, very New York receptionist who is still the receptionist, I believe, at Razorfish, She's Joanne. She's retiring this Oh, year. my gosh. So yeah. those of you that know Joanne. And she would answer the phone, eyeballs, like that. You know, that was <laughs> so awesome. And you could just hear it through the hallways. And then you'd hear her go, no, no, not big balls, eyeballs. <laughs> and that was so, you know, this was sort of the environment that I worked in. And, uh, and you know, it was You've like, matured so much. I, ha I have. I have kids and all these, yeah. Um, procreation is not a license for grown-up <laughs> behavior. So anyway, we just... Um, we rode that wave and it was fantastic. It was really fun. So imagine like 1993 and you're building a company and, and you know, one day you're sitting down with Jerry Yang and he's telling you about things called hot words that they might sell. And then the next day he shows up with an entourage of people from SoftBank 
I mean, this was, it was all just spinning up so quickly. So a lot of good timing, I think. But you, you brushed through the big agency experience like it was perfectly normal, but you were an intern and ordering pizzas for the team, and then you're in a chat room, right? and it was Steve Klein that you yes, talked to, yes. and you go from ordering pizza to starting a company. I mean, that, that is a big leap. <laughs> right, right, right. But not when you're a manic depressive, because oh, you just okay, do yeah. things, you, know, you don't really <laughs> think about them. Um, no, I, I mean, really, I was, um, I had this boss, this is probably going to bite me if this, since this is being recorded, but his, uh, his name and he was sort of your quintessential agency media director. And so there was, um, there was some pent up frustration on my part that all of the ideas I had as the gopher of the group were sort of shut down in, in sort of true you know, who are you? You're the pizza girl. Why do you keep talking in this meeting? You know, kind of, and I think that was a motivator for me to realize that big agency wasn't for me. I wanted to start something. I wanted to be able to kind of, you know, be my own boss, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I, I think the agency culture has obviously matured and changed quite a bit. There's some of it that's still there. But those were sort of hangover days from the 80s where agencies just ruled the roost and, and TV dollars were massive and it was all about the upfront. Um, and there still wasn't a lot of innovation and room for uh, young people to have big ideas. So I think part of it was I, I didn't see a path forward there, and that helped me with that transition to seek something out, hence hanging out in chat rooms. Yeah. Uh, so, you, so you start Eyeballs. You, you later get recruited away from Eyeballs to Avenue A here in Seattle, mm -hmm. and by sheer coincidence, soon thereafter, Avenue A buys eyeballs. Right, total coincidence. Um, <laughs> right, that was, um, that was really, that was very exciting. In a lot of ways, the way that, that happened was very, it was organic. I mean, you know, I had, I was sort of found myself in this place in New York City where the money was gushing. I mean, it was just, you know, everybody had to have a dot com all of a sudden, and everybody needed a portal deal, and um, the parties were massive. And I'm like drinking backstage with Yoko Ono, like at a Sonic Net party. I don't, you know, these were wild. I mean, truly, the stories are wild. And, um, and I, I, I guess, you know, we just sort of found ourselves um, being pursued because there were probably only 500 of us at the time between San Francisco and New York doing this kind of stuff. So all of us found ourselves really being pursued. And uh, uh, one of those phone calls was a very persuasive group of guys in Seattle. Uh, and not only were they persuasive, um, they were smart. So we had a lot of hubris and we had a lot of money, but I'm not really sure how smart we were in the early dot-com days, but this group of guys in Seattle were like smart, you know? And, and, uh, and this is when I first, of course, met Nick Hanauer and Mike Galgon, and they really wanted to build technology that was far and away um, better than anything we were using to place ads, buy ads, measure ads. The vision was big. We called it, they called it OBS, the optimal buying system. That's our, that's the first incarnation of Atlas, by the way. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that was where the, the lights kind of went off for me after a lot of conversations with a lot of people that were in pursuit of someone who knew something about online advertising was how unparalleled the thinking was by those guys. Yeah. It was hard for me to say no. Yeah. And that, and that joining Avenue A, that, that sort of, for, for you career-wise, marked a turn from agency life to really more of a technology career, mm -hmm. which, which you've had since. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've worked in the technology business in Seattle, you've started companies, you've invested in companies, you've advised companies. What, what is your take on the state of the startup culture in Seattle? You know, you've, you've worked with a lot of companies in the Valley and, and certainly in New York. What, what do you think it is about Seattle that works or doesn't for startups? Yeah, I mean, uh, I feel uh, lucky, particularly in the last uh, six, seven years of my career to have experienced, you know, the gamut of startups from entertainment to um, self-help to just technology, platform, plumbing, cloud-based services. And 
Um, in Seattle, the one thing that sort of remains consistent for me is there's this uh, air of, and I don't, I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back here, but there's generally this air of humility in our startup culture, which is I don't have it figured out yet. I need m more people to talk to. I need more time to perfect it. Um, and not that I don't love my, uh, you know, VC friends in Menlo Park, but it's a different culture there, which is, this is the best idea you ever heard. It will be the biggest thing that's ever been developed. Um, and, and that's more of the culture there. It's hard. When I did my, my fundraising in Menlo, it was hard for me to put that on, actually, because we didn't, we, we weren't kind of raised that way in the Seattle startup culture. Um, we were raised with sort of this idea that you go in and you say, okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of things I need to do still. It's not perfect. I, I'm not sure you know, if you're going to really want to invest in this, but I'm excited for these reasons, you know, it's sort of a different, and, you know, they'd look at me and say, okay, you got to <laughs> yeah, go back and rewrite this deck about why this is the best thing since sliced bread. What I will say is that we don't have a great um, startup culture around the arts, and that bums me out. I feel like we've taken this incredible STEM culture that we have here and we've created a lot of plumbing and a lot of platforms. Uh, and what I haven't seen really is us use that same um, culture of, of being in the arts that we have in Seattle to create m really interesting startups. Um, it's like they're two different worlds almost. And we leave that kind of entertainment and art stuff to to LA. I mean, these aren't even creative people. I don't even in LA. <laughs> they, you know what I mean? So I think that I'm, I can say that really. I, I lived there. I have friends there. No, they, I mean, I, it bums me out. I do feel like we should, um, our next tranche of startups should come from filmmakers and writers and actors and philosophers and musicians. And, and that, would, that would thrill me to, to no end. Great. Uh, you talked about the different companies that you've been involved with in Seattle. As as you look across, you know, from from entertainment to self help to the to the to the cloud, are there characteristics of successful employees that you've seen that you've worked with <clears throat> colleagues of yours over the years? Yes. Um, this is this is a tough question. Um, and the reason I think it's so hard is because um, some of those characteristics cluster around things that we require um, in a human being to be successful in the current startup culture. And, and those are things like, you know, being a corporate athlete and, and uh, fortitude. You know, I'm a Midwestern kid, so my dad raised me with the there's no crying in baseball, you know, mentality. And so... Often, I know we're gonna. I know this is gonna come up at some point. But often, you know, inevitably, like there would there'd be a crier on the team, and they'd send him or her to me because I'm a chick, and I, like I'm gonna understand that. And I think I would often not do a, a very good job of um, balancing the. I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying so hard to say this in a way that's. You are the last person I would send a crier to. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know. You're fired? No, I didn't say. Um, no, I no, I'm kidding. I would never do that. Um, you would have me do it. I would have you do it. <laughs> Fruits of the spirit. So I think that um, there are certain characteristics that we require in our current startup culture. But I also have sort of a beef with our current startup culture, in that it's inc incredibly you know male centric. And I think we could take a good long look at what that means to be a, you know sort of a male centric culture, uh, and. Uh, and, and that's a complicated, that's a loaded conversation because um, we can easily slip, slip into signing attributes to one gender or the other and then calling that our culture. And it's far more complex than that. It's, a, it's more about appreciating the philosophy of Abe Lincoln, which you know I subscribe to, which is the whole idea of you know, a, a cabinet of many or a cabinet of rivals uh, because the collective... Uh, view of all those different lenses is far richer and far more creative than one. And, and I think that's where we could do a better job in our startup culture. It is really, um, there's a, it's a tough, there's a tough guy culture. There's a survivor kind of mentality in, in startup culture. And so I think to some degree that scares away certain personalities. 
so I know you you said it was kind of a loaded topic, but but I want to talk about it. Um, there's been a growing amount of attention, uh, rightfully so, about the lack of female executives, entrepreneurs, board members in the technology industry, arguably business more broadly. Um, as somebody who's been all three, an executive, an entrepreneur, a board member, what are your impressions of the, the state of gender equity and gender diversity in, in the workplace? Yep. Yeah, okay. Let me, well, so let me start by saying recently on Facebook, I, I, I posted an article that I read about how there's still sort of this pay uh, gap for, for women. It was actually, it was remarkably um, improved and it was a lot less than pre, but I just posted it, you know, as a dutiful feminist and would, and I put it up there. You know, and all my guy friends who are like stay at home dads and like just artists and all these really cool, not like tough guy kind of things. and. And um, man, they were so pissed at me. Like they really did not like the tone of the article. And so it made me realize that even I need to kind of be careful and not use my girl license to say whatever the hell I want, <laughs> want to say, whatever I want, whenever I want to say it. Um, but I have been lucky in a couple ways um, on this front. And it's led me to develop some um, opinions around the matter that uh, have helped me. Um, I've been lucky, one, that I started out my career faced with a terrible experience of being discriminated against at a Japanese company. And that sort of opened my eyes wide up, like sort of the most blatant experience you could have there. And I, I think that was a great moment to say, like, hey, it exists, you know, eyes wide open, you know. And then I had this other extreme experience where I worked with some of the most amazing um, feminists of our time, and, and they're all men, by the way, <laughs> like none of them were women, but, um, and some of them are, are people that we both have worked with, and some unlikely ones, too, and, uh, and so I really had this great uh, breadth of experience with this particular issue, and the question gets posed to me a lot, you know, how should women uh, balance out the culture of, you know, that sort of male-centric startup culture? What I often tell women is this. Um, I don't tell them lean in. I'm not saying Cheryl doesn't have a point, but I kind of think sometimes I think we need to lean back and not lean in. But, um, but what I would say is that um, the attributes that sometimes least fit in are those that are most valuable. And it's incredibly difficult because it's human nature to want belongingness and to conform, to remember not to lose those. This really goes for anybody, obviously. Um, but in, in the face of a very male-centric culture, it is likely that you will start to do things like trim the number of adverbs you use when you speak, or refrain from using emoticons in your emails, <laughs> or maybe even one less exclamation point because they all are behaviors that are sort of linked to what we think of as female qualities, which for some reason isn't something we want to display in the workforce. And that they couldn't go hand in hand with also being the girl that never cries. And I think that that's the one thing I put out there is just to re remember that not all conformity in order to become a group and have that belongingness, which is important, is good conformity. Um, and not all things that we think are linked to something that's undesirable are actually linked to the undesirable. Um, so it's a little bit uh, pie in the sky, but it, it's something it took me forever to figure out. You know, like I would just, it would pain me. Jeff would write back like, okay, and I'd be like, what does that mean? <laughs> ah, you know, and I'd write like 12 sentences, and then I'd be like, oh, he's going to think I'm a little, you know, and I'd, you know, race them all, and then I'd write back, one sentence, and I'd look at it again, and then I'd go, got it, and I'd write that back, and I'd go, like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> woo! <laughs> Nearly was perceived as incompetent, but you know, like, um, Jeff also, humbly being one of the feminists that I've gotten to work with, um, would point out to me what a loser I am that way. So, um, I think that, you know, while that's not an answer, to your question. It is a reflective statement about really sort of getting excited about our differences, bringing back some of the things that we used to think of as uh, not good workplace behavior, too much emotion and expressiveness. And, um, but you know, they say that sometimes the answers are found at the point in an interaction that is most uncomfortable and that you want to lean away from 
and you're just a stone's throw away from actually getting to the solution, but we pull back because you can feel the emotion or the tension rising there, and then you miss that moment of ingenuity or innovation or creativity. Um, and so I think that's one of those ways that, you know, it's not male, it's not female, but we have learned a certain behavior, which is when things escalate in a meeting, somebody says, well, Joe, let's just, let's just take that offline. We all know we've used that a lot of times. Nobody likes that level of discomfort in the room, but ask yourself if you, if you really should, or maybe you're at that inflection point of genius. Yeah, and, and you know, to hear you talk about, um, you know, deciding or pulling back on what to write in an email or how to position something, I, I think one of the attributes that you have that I always admired is, you, you know, you've known who you are and you went with it. And even though your approach and personality, you know, might have been different than Brian McAndrews, mm -hmm. to say the least, <laughs> uh, you, you were just, you know, you were very authentic. And he and I and others recognized it and valued it. And, uh, you know, even if you had internal debates, it certainly never showed because you, you had an amazing <laughs> consistency in, in staying true to who you were. Thank you. That's, that's uh, let's, let's talk a little bit um, about uh, kind of the same topic, but, but the, you, you know, the, the work-life balance, you know, that term gets thrown around a lot. I, I think, um, you know, in your 20s and 30s, um, you know, when you've sort of gone from the, the dropout to the entrepreneur and successful executive at Aquanib and Microsoft and, and starting more companies, um, while you were doing all those great things and achieving so much in your career, uh, you also got married. You had three kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been able to strike that balance. What, what's that been like? How hard has it been to strike the balance of, you know, these three great kids and, <laughs> and Daryl, your husband, and, and still moving forward with your career, albeit with pauses along the way? Huh. Well, it's been a total shit show, really. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just a daily battle of, you know, is the nanny coming? Or did you say you were picking them up? I thought I was going to go to the thing. You said you were going to go to the. Th I mean, you know. Um, but at the, in the end, uh, I think the the wisdom that has come out of uh, uh, my personal experience there with the balance is that um, if you enjoy the creation process, if you enjoy work in the sense that it's a creative aspect of who you are, it's fulfilling in so many ways that um, are very different than having a spouse or having children which are incredibly fulfilling in their own ways, then you make room for it. And you would be surprised how clever and creative you can get. Um, and so I think I, I still to this day I say that and I kind of laugh at myself because I think every day I wake up and go, I can't figure out how to do this all. I don't know. <laughs> but I think that, um, well, not right now. It's pretty good right now. Yeah. But um, I think that, that that's the truth of the matter, that if you enjoy it, you'll figure out a way to, to do it. Um, and don't worry. Every second of the way, you'll think you won't figure it out. And every second of the way, you'll be sure that you're frayed at the edges and everybody can see it. And maybe sometimes they do, but who really cares? Um, and, and, uh, and sometimes you'll decide you're not enjoying it and you make a shift and you dial it back. I mean, I can tell you that, um, like to your point with the pauses, there's been moments where I've just said, I gotta check out for a minute here. Um, and those are sacrifices for sure. Uh, and that, at every turn, has been a moment where I've said, well, if I pause, I'm definitely, no one's going to need me, or my knowledge is going to go in the toilet. And, um, you know, it's amazing how wrong you are about that. Because uh, smart people are smart people, and passionate people are passionate people, and you like what you do, you, you come right back up to speed in no time at all. So I guess it's a statement of just don't, you know, you'll have the doubt, but know that that's normal, and just roll with it. Yeah. You, you mentioned sacrifices that you've made. I think it's also important to note that that your husband Daryl's made sacrifices as well. He he gave up his practice as a pulmonologist here in Seattle to, to follow you to Chicago for your career, mm -hmm. yeah. and then you followed him back here for his career. <laughs> yes. yeah. So it, it hasn't just been you know you. It's it, it has been very much a sort of a, a shared commitment to to striking that right balance. Yeah, and that's. Um, 
I mean, that's, you know, get a great marriage counselor and, like, you know, <laughs> be sure to talk about it all and, you know. But I do think um, that actually made it better in many ways to, to, you know, I know there's a very great working model there where one parent stays home, and that's great. That's just not the reality for many of us uh, for many reasons. But let me make a case for having two working parents. Um, and that's that there's a, there's a togetherness, there's a we're in the same boat thing there that is enormously unifying on many fronts, even if it's not unifying in the singular moment of who's doing pickup and who's doing drop off. But on the whole, it's incredibly unifying and it's really made for rich um, interactions for me and my husband where we come home and we share our work experiences and the intensity of those and the drama of those and we're met with a lot of empathy and a lot of encouragement and uh, I cherish that in fact I, I think uh, part of what we always get nervous about if one dials it down is if we're gonna get the kind of uh, sounding board that we've enjoyed so much in the other person so yeah, the, the downside of that sounding board is when Daryl shares his experience as a doctor Somehow it leads to you thinking that you're a doctor and giving free right. advice, medical right. advice to, right. to folks. Right. This is true. Right. She will hand out free medical advice. Well, I know a lot. I want to tell you, it's been impossible for me not to learn a lot. And so my diagnoses are relatively spot on. I'm not backing down from that. I, I won't um, cut anyone open, but I will. I'm free clinic. I'm open all the time. So. Uh, yeah, I thought you were going to go for a different jab. I thought you were going to talk about how when he shares his stories, it always really trivializes what I do for a living. Oh, that, yeah. You know, he said they're like saving people's lives, and I'm kicking sand all night because, you know, we didn't win an account or somebody wrote an email that made me look like an idiot in front of a group of people or something, like, you know, and he's like, yeah, honey, I'm so sorry for that. And, you know, today's brain aneurysm, you know, it was really, you know, like, uh, so he's yeah, also, it's also a good perspective kind of person to be married to. Yeah. So I've probably uh, pried into your personal life enough, so I'll shift back to uh, more business specific <laughs> topics. Uh, you continue to work with Nick Hanauer and, and his partner, Mike Slade, and, and uh, you know, Rich Bartonwell, who's the founder of Expedia and Zillow. and many other companies. Uh, so you, you have a, an incredible view into startups and the, the backers of those startups. What are the, the, the companies or the categories that you think are most interesting right now outside of Mixpo? Uh, outside of Mixpo. Um, well, uh, I'll make a plug for one company that I'm always talking about because it's so fascinating to me. Um, and that's Real Self. And this is a company that I advise as well. And they, uh, who, does anyone here know Real Self already? Are you familiar with it? Okay. So uh, I, I can never get anyone to admit, so thank you for that, because people always <laughs> assume that as soon as I tell you what it is, that there's a reason why you want it. It's the world's largest plastic surgery research site. Okay. So I know at least half of you know it, and you just haven't raised your hands. That's <laughs> um, no, I'm, all kidding aside, it's you know, one of the things that I didn't mention this, and I should have probably when you asked about our startup culture, thanks to people like Rich and Nick, we do have a burning desire, dare I use the word, to disrupt um, industries that ha are ripe for disruption. Um, in fact, I'd say we're better at it than anybody around here. Um, they've really built a culture around that. And Real Self is right in that alleyway. Here we have this, this whisper topic plastic surgery and all the stuff that goes around it you know like weight loss and injectables and Botox and all that um, and it's massive and it's growing so quickly and yet the best way to get any information about it or to talk to somebody about it is to like you know go to the yellow pages and find a doctor's name like you would a dentist in a book that you got from your employer you know I mean it's just ridiculous and uh, and so of course Tom Seary saw that as, a, as an opportunity to get in there and actually, you know, take the whisper out of it and let people talk about it, let doctors get in the mix, and it's exploded. Um, their traffic grows. It's like it's a startup that is way too profitable and growing way too quickly, if there was ever such a thing. Um, and so I've really, I put a plug in for, for that as being a really interesting space. But think about, thinking about spaces like that, um, I think that we're, you know, everybody has seen the food business. That's so, that's so interesting to me. 
Um, whether or not you're bringing food from restaurants to people who are at work or at home, or you're making food yourself for people who are um, at work or at home. It's a business that um, we just haven't rethought really completely in so long. And while there's a lot of startups popping up in that space, you have to think that given the size of, I can't remember how many billions of dollars that we spend on eating out every year, it's insane. But Given the size of that marketplace, we've probably only got a small fraction of the number of companies that can survive inside of a TAM like that. So yeah. um, that would be the other space I think is really very interesting to me right now as well. I also think, of course, you know, and this is not about Mixbo, but generally speaking, I'm a big advocate for the return of uh, a Mad Men-ish mentality, which is to say, I think we went a little extreme, and I know you and I are a big part of creating this culture, on the commoditized advertising <laughs> bandwagon, and we really have forgotten about storytelling and pure creativity in the ads we deliver to a large degree online. And I see the return of that, and I think businesses that, that help put a focus or a lens on that creativity um, that's super exciting and interesting to me too. Very good. So one of the reasons that uh, we had Matt McElwain in and, and now Maggie is to, uh, as, as I've said before, demystify the board a little bit. So I want to make sure that uh, we la leave questions from all of you that, uh, that you might have for Maggie. I've covered quite a bit about her career and, and personal life and, <laughs> uh, and various other topics, but uh, I'll open it up now for uh, questions that uh, any of you might have. At what point did you kind of make that transition from, uh, you know, super stressed out, like just go, go, go. I'm starting, you know, businesses and trying to make it to like, oh, I kind of made it. Like, I might be okay. Ah, that's a really good question. Um, I, did I make that transition? I don't know. Yeah, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that. Um, there was definitely a transition for me um, at the point, I think, at which. Um, I had just uh, launched King of the Web, and I and I and there was a moment in there where um, Scott Howe and I were at IKEA buying desks, <laughs> and it was like the most fun I'd had in ages. You know, I just finished like GMing this large group at Microsoft that was a collection of a lot of forgotten technologies for publishers and it didn't have the right support and anyway so I you know I think all of a sudden transitioning into this place where we were buying IKEA furniture and getting back to some of the basics of being passionate and just building a business with our bare hands um, that was a cool inflection point for me that was that felt like um, gosh you know I feel confident about having traveled all these different countries and learning learned all their languages enough to kind of leap off the cliff and do something a little nutty. And I, I felt like that was a, a grown-up moment for me. It, was, it requires sort of the setting aside of some ego, which can, can be hard to do, um, to say, this is probably going to be a complete and total failure, but I'm doing it anyway. And so that, was, that might be it. So grown-up as opposed to your first startup. Right, first startup was more like, I don't know who I am, I just need, need to like keep swimming or I'll sink to the bottom, you know? <laughs> That's more like how you kind of find yourself in your 20s, at least in, you know, in my uh, chaotic brain, it was, it was about uh, just never, n never stopping for a second, you know, and just, just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And so that was a moment of pause for me. Other questions? Hi, Maggie. Near the beginning of your conversation with Jeff, uh, you made a comment about an article you posted on Facebook, and you mentioned that you maybe shouldn't use your girl license to post it. Yeah. Uh, would you mind like clarifying and expanding upon that? Because from, I think, all of our perspectives, you're a pretty successful person who just also happens to be a woman. So wh where was that disconnect for you? Um, 
Let me make sure I understand the question I'm clarifying. Is it that I shouldn't have used the girl license or is it that why do I view myself less as a successful person and more as a, someone using the girl license? Oh, it was, uh, it was why did you think you shouldn't have used the girl license? Oh. Or maybe you shouldn't have posted oh. that. I mean, it, it seems like you're, right. uh, I don't know if uniquely qualified. Right. I can tell you. Term, no, that's a good. But. I said that because I am a girl, and girls say sorry all the time for shit they shouldn't say sorry for. And so, oh. <laughs> so I take it back. Good, you totally called me out on that. That was a good point. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It's true, right? Don't, I mean, you're like, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't even know why I just said that to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I just said that. I'm sorry I did. <laughs> okay. Moving on, okay? I'm going to have to go to therapy after this. <laughs> And Mike. <laughs> um, hi, Maggie. I'm curious what you think you bring to the board that wasn't kind of there already, and, and more specifically, what that translates into, like, what is Mixpo going to do, do differently uh, once we kind of get you, get you moving? Yeah. Well, okay, so I, I think Jeff and I talked a lot about, obviously, about his business um, prior to me joining the board as well, being colleagues and friends. And, and, and one of the things that um, I have a particular interest in is seeing companies in um, big industries um, keep industries from becoming too big. And I think you guys are in a very unique position to stand up to what is quickly becoming a bit of a, you know, maybe, I won't call it a monopoly, I won't even call it a duopoly, but there are some very big players here that are in the video space and very quickly consuming all of the dollars and calling the shots and developing all the technology. And advertisers and publishers, niche publishers, don't like that. And they never will and they shouldn't. And I think part of a healthy ecosystem is having players like Mixpo that are able to be objective third-party partners to those niche publishers and those advertisers. Um, and can innovate not just in stream with those big players, but can actually innovate on top of them. So they're not necessarily trying to create the big underlying platforms, but what they're able to do is say, well, thanks for doing all that hard work, and now I can look at the pieces that are actually missing that advertisers and publishers really wish they had to make this even better. Um, and I think that you guys have this opportunity to do that. And that's frankly what I've spent most of my career focused on is not so much trying to develop the huge underlying platform, although we inadvertently created one of them, but we were actually just trying to improve the existing um, structures. We were trying to improve the workflow in an existing ecosystem when we built you know, the media buying system. And we were trying to improve the, the, the workflow and the analytics in an existing system, trying to work with Donovan when we, when we built Atlas. You know? and so, I think that's where um, I feel like this is in my wheelhouse, and I'm excited to be part of that conversation. And I'll just I'll just add, you know, as as I think about the board and and what I can learn from the board, uh, the way that I can use the board, you know, it's important to me to have a diversity of experiences, of perspectives. You know, some people are very experienced in the industry, others may be more focused on finance, but, but the industry is, is a little more new to them. Um, it's, it's important to have a lot of different ideas that, that I can sort of condense into the best strategy for the company. Um, at the same time, it's, it's really critical to have somebody that is not you know, too uh, emotionally attached to the business in, in that they're not willing to change their mind. They're not willing to, you know, call me on a bad idea or a bad approach. I've already done that like three times. Yeah, and, <laughs> um, and, if, and if there's one thing I can say about Maggie, she will tell you what's reality and what isn't. And so um, there are, you know, to put it in, in sort of a sports term, there, there are a lot of intangibles that Maggie brings that uh, I think will be a huge benefit for us. Okay, so I'm always kind of interested in uh, the startup world and hearing stories. Uh, it's often in the startup world, the spotlight is shown on companies that have success. Um, but with startups, failure really is often the key. Yeah. And so I'm kind of curious and to hear some stories that you may uh, want to share with the group that 
either were pivotal moments, uh, failures that led to something awesome, or just really entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, well, pivotal moments are um, abundant um, in that, whew, like, uh, I mean, Jeff may have regaled some of these already, but certainly what comes to mind is the moment at which we uh, relieved ourselves of 80% of our clients during the bubble crash at uh, Avenue A and subsequently only like 10% of our revenue, um, but uh, which so making it a good decision. But, uh, you know, I think that there were these moments where we realized that parts of the industry we had banked on in those early days were crashing and burning. Um, and you were building tools and you were building services around those parts of the industry, and you had to stop and realize they were crashing and burning. Um, that is the hardest part of any startup experience, is that you have to very swiftly realize you were wrong about the direction of the marketplace, and then pivot on it. Um, and you will go through that several times before you land in a place where you feel like you're on solid ground and you've got something that's enduring. Um, and part of that endurance just comes from having the muscle to build and rebuild when things aren't going well, not just that you found something that never goes out of fashion. Um, that's hard work. It requires a lot of patience, and it requires just this sort of, this is where I really, I do think that sort of corporate athleticism <laughs> is a good quality. It, it's this ability, I always would joke with the, the, my last team, my last startup, I would say, you know, I may not be right much of the time, but I'm telling you, I'm like Homer Simpson. Like, you can keep hitting me in the ring, and I just keep getting up. Like, I'll just do that. <laughs> I'll just keep getting up. You know, and I'm toothless and bloodied, and I'll just keep standing up, and people think you're crazy. But there's an element of crazy in startups, and I think that you have to accept that and roll with it. Because if you're trying to make it sane, you're trying to recreate your, like, you know, Fortune 500 job that you had out of college, you're going to be miserable because the people are crazier because they were attracted to do this, and the market's crazier, and the company's off kilter most of the time. Um, and so if that sounds bad to anyone here, I would suggest, you know, brush off the resume. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but generally speaking, um, it's a lot longer, it's a lot longer um, time frame than anyone thinks. Sure, we all read about the one in every 900,000 startups that sells in their third year for a billion dollars. I'm pissed at Twitch right now, actually, because they just <laughs> sold them. But anyway, so, you know, um, knowing gamers so well, <laughs> as I now do. Um, but, you know, that's not reality. What reality is, is perseverance. So that's sort of a, um, not so much a, a rich tale, but as it is advice. But I think that um, I can't forget those days of the bubble bursting and how hard that was on us. And the only redeeming quality I think we really had at that point wasn't our technology or, or our IQ or any of that stuff. I think it was our ability to, while everyone was ducking and running for cover, to just stand up and fight. <laughs> I mean, really, um, we just stood up and fought. And, and a lot of credit is owed to that, that core team that endured that. Um, those are hard. I mean, I, I had this boyfriend back then, and I would go down. He'd pick me up. I mean, all day long, I was so tough. And then I'd get in the car, and I would just weep the whole way home, <laughs> like, in the car. <laughs> it would be like, I'd be, like, on three hours of sleep for, like, you know, a week. And I would just, I literally, I would weep. And he would just sit there, and we'd sit in silence, and he'd drive me home. <laughs> <laughs> So I think about that. Shocking that relationship didn't work yeah, out. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Sounds lovely. <laughs> but, you know, I do think um, that's one of them. Now, maybe um, in the startup world, maybe some, you know, funnier stories are like, uh, here's what, you know, talk about, you know, just feeling your way out through things and finding your place in the world. You know, at King, we had developed, because it's recent, so it's top of mind, but we had developed, um, for those who don't know, we developed a uh, sort of a social gaming platform, if you will, but in reality, not in, not in virtual reality. And the premise of it was sort of American Idol on the web. And it became the, the largest, longest running talent show on the web. 
and uh, until we failed and killed it. But anyway, so that it was it was really awesome in, for a period of time, and it was. Um, in this one moment where I realized, you know, suddenly that virtual goods was tanking around us, you know, as a revenue stream, and Zynga was, you know, going under, and all these bad things were happening, and so we were like, well, look, we all know advertising, right? Everybody knows that. So, so we, we were like, we had this huge audience, this cool thing, native platform, built some cool stuff, and the first place we went to go sell it was Disney. Now, this platform contained a category called uh, Gaming King, and gamers are known for being sort of largely 17-year-old white males in Arkansas, and they are crass, and um, there's not much I can do about that. But uh, I just remember sitting there at Disney, getting ready to show them the platform, and the guy who was currently winning that day, now ma imagine me and my colleague Sheena go in, you know, with all the pictures on the walls are the big ears and the primary colors, and they've got all the pictures of the smiling tweens that have no problems and cute outfits on and everything. <laughs> and, and I go in this room, and I've got like, uh, I got the EVP of digital marketing and all these, you know, and, um, and we broadcast the site up on the screen, and the winner was just happening that day. We thought it'd be fun to see them, let them see the winning happen and how we crown somebody. Uh, and the winner happened to be a comedian, actually not even a gamer, but he's also a gamer on the side. And the video that he had posted that he had won on was blasted up on the screen, and the title of it was, Ever Want to Slap a Bitch? That was the... <laughs> that was, <laughs> Just take that in for a minute. I just want you to put yourself in that room, in that moment. Now, he was a Chris Rock style comedian, and if you get his whole shtick, it's kind of very, it's like a little bit of misogyny, but it's really pretty funny. And like, so anyway, it's, um, but it was, it was, a, it was a, just a horrific moment of rethinking this idea that we should be an ad <laughs> and in the ad business. <laughs> I think that was sort of one of those, that was a pivotal moment, you know, <laughs> the flight home, we were like, you know, I don't know if we should, if we should keep trying to sell ads to <laughs> Clorox and <laughs> Johnson and Johnson. The anymore. misogynist demo yeah, the wasn't misogyn a money maker. Yeah, right. The misogynist demo wasn't hot, so we didn't, <laughs> that wasn't good for us. But, so there's a one funny tale anyway, yeah. Other questions? Well, I have one. Um, I know you've been on a lot of different boards, and you probably have your choice of which ones you are on. So, Mike, what's kind of your mental checklist as you decide what you want to be a part of? You know, I wish I could be more thoughtful in this. <laughs> like, I wish I had been more thoughtful so that I could give you a really good way that I went about this. But it was not very systematic. I mean, a lot of it has been... Um, that just sounds cool. <laughs> I, and I've been going through that. Um, I've had a, several meetings recently um, where I felt like that bad date, you know, where like you let them, someone like really show you a good time and, you know, and then you're like, well, it's been nice hanging out with you. But I'm like, you know, it just, you realize it's not going to work. This isn't a good fit for me. And I think that's been, that's been liberating. I've been guiding my choices less by looking at, um, looking at things through the lens of an MBA and saying, is this a great business, you know, which is, I think, what makes a VC tick, really. You know, it almost doesn't matter what the industry is and what the widget is, but is it a great business? And I think that's a really neat way to think about things. I also think there's this more hedonistic way to look at things, which is, what do I really like to do, you know? And that's where I've been, um, that's where I've been coming from lately. And it's been, um, it's been refreshing. It's really been fun. Great. Well, uh, Maggie, thank you so much. Uh, I, I've been asked uh, multiple times since I've been at Mixbo um, who I turn to when I've got tough questions to answer, and uh, your name is always one of the first that, uh, that I mention. So uh, certainly appreciate your help and guidance and friendship over the years, and I'm, I'm really excited that uh, you're now formally going to help Mixbo and, and uh, expect to do great things together. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys.